Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 18th of February, 2017. It's a Q&A session, so let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, Anna Corey asks a question. Hi, Curtis, as always, thank you for doing this question and answer session. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I have a question about recording the sound of a martial arts or yoga teacher. I've been watching yoga videos, and the ones I've watched use either a lavalier or one of the headset mics you would put on the talent, which I'm guessing could be a good option for recording good, clean sound. Am I right? My question is, can you recommend a decent, inexpensive headset mic that I could use for this kind of shooting, something that I could use with my Tascam DR60D Mark II. All right, let's look, let's talk at that <laughs> first. Um, the Countryman E6 is a uh, kind of an ear-worn microphone that comes down on the cheek. The really nice thing about these is as the talent turns their head, the microphone follows them. Also, in terms of overall response of the microphone, the quality of the sound, I usually find that putting mics on people's heads sound a lot better than putting them down on their chest or other parts of their body. So that's one option. This particular one has a 3.5 millimeter locking connector, TRS. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what you're, if you're going to run into a wireless system. If you don't run into a wireless system, you're going to have a, a Tascam <laughs> recorder tethered to your person. That's going to be tricky. So I'm assuming you have some sort of solution worked out for that. Um, but that's one option. A more budget option would be this uh, JK uh, headset microphone. This one's a little bit different in terms of its design. It actually has clips that come over both ears and a sort of metal band that goes around the back of the head. This one is more secure in terms of staying on the person without using any tape or anything, but it can be more restrictive and some people don't like working with these. Um, it's kind of a matter of preference. So um, I haven't used this one in particular. I have used some of other some of JK's other microphones. They're for, for as cheap as they are, they're actually quite good. So there's another option there. Again, this one also has a 3.5 millimeter locking uh, plug. Yeah, for Sennheiser wireless system. That's a that's a standard pretty I mean, technically not a standard, I guess, but very common. So hopefully that's helpful for you there. Also, one experiment I'm doing this morning is to use my two NT1A mics, put them on mic stands as close as possible to the talent, one on the left and the other on the right with some distance from each other, so that when my talent moves his left to his left or his right, I have a mic recording on either direction. What do you think of this idea? I think that you're very creative and that's a great idea. <laughs> um, that's actually been used uh, in large budget productions, the uh, Hobbit movies. I know that they mic'd up Martin Freeman, who played the Hobbit, um, he had kind of a collar, actually something like this, much larger, of course, but um, they actually put a Countryman B6 lavalier microphone in each of the lapels so that when he would turn his head, they would be able to get a good recording from either direction. So same concept that you're working on here. So I think it's a great idea. I hope it, uh, hope it works out for you and let us know your experience with that. Okay, the next one is from Maurice Bellou. Hi, Curtis. I need a second shotgun mic for interviews. I've been using a VidPro XM55 for a couple of years and would like to upgrade for my second mic. I want to stay within the $300 range. Do you have some recommendations? Um, I do. Let's uh, talk about those. I've talked about these before. I've, I'll put a link to the, the review where I, sort of a meta review actually, where I talk about all the microphones I've used personally and uh, which ones I like and don't like. Um, I talk about some of these. Uh, I know for sure I talk about the Rode NTG2 and the, I think I I did talk about the ME66. I don't own the Sennheiser ME66, but it's a very good option. Um, you can actually find it, I think, oftentimes for a little bit less than 270 US. Um, this mic, uh, the, the thing that kind of stands out to me about this mic is that it is very sensitive. So the nice thing about that is you don't have to have a high-end recorder to make it work well um, because it puts out a very strong signal for uh, for a shotgun microphone. So. That's a good option. The only thing I don't love about this mic is it tends to be a little bit more, and this is a personal opinion, so some people love it. Um, for me, it's okay. Um, not my first choice, but <laughs> um, it tends to be a little bit bright, and that, and what I mean by that is that the higher frequencies tend to be a little bit more prominent. So if you have someone with a sibilant voice like myself, um, those S's and C's start to really sizzle and to be a little bit on the, um, they're a little harsh. If, uh, if from my point of view, but for people with dark voices, these are awesome microphones. You, you often doing things like that for its price. It's a very good microphone. So there's an option there. The Rode NTG2 is another option. Um, you know, it's not the same as a $2,000 Sheps, but, um, it, it sounds pretty good. I like the sound of the NTG2. The, um, 
The thing with ANTG2 is it does not have a very strong output level. So what you need to keep in mind here is it depends on what recorder you're using as to whether or not this is a good record or a good microphone or it's going to work well for you. It's a good microphone, but whether or not it'll work well and get you the results you want. So because it's not doesn't have the strongest output signal, you need to use quite a bit of gain to get a strong enough signal. And that is going to push the preamplifiers on your recorder, whatever recorder you happen to be using. Now, if you have a recorder that has very good clean inputs um, and provides plenty of gain, then this will work just fine. Um, I used this for a long time with my Tascam DR60D Mark II and had, I would say, good results. I was happy with it. If you go on the Zoom H recorders, I would stay away from the H4N Pro with this because um, it just doesn't provide quite enough gain to make this one work well. Um, H4N Pro and above, H5, H6, those seem to work pretty decently. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. So hopefully that's helpful for you, Maurice. Thanks for the question. All right, next question from, I think it's Andre, is if hopefully I said that right. How do I find the right balance setting gain on my sound recorder, which is a sound device of 633, especially for the line ins, port four to six? What can I do to keep the noise floor low? Thank you. Okay, um, so the sound device of 633 is a little bit different than a lot of the more consumer and prosumer level recorders. The meters that it has on it are actually DBU meters. So it's not a peak meter like you typically have on most, um, again, consumer or prosumer level recorders because it's actually a mixer. And so that meter is an analog meter, uh, DBU meter. And so it's measuring the voltage coming out of the mic as opposed to the digital signal of the mic. Um, in that case, you'll notice that the meter on the sound device is 633 kind of has a center point at zero DBU. And usually that's where I aim to get the peaks right around there. Um, that leaves enough headroom for when the, the talent gets really, really loud. And right now I'm, I'm, I'm talking mainly in terms of the, the microphone, setting the gain structure on the microphone. We'll come to the line ins in just a minute. Um, so usually when I, you know, I get those peaks right around there, for most cases, um, sometimes I have to pull it back just a little bit if the person has a very dynamic voice and there's going to be, um, and there's periodic laughing and stuff. I had a job yesterday, in fact, where the talent, um, had a very dynamic voice where he would get excited about something and start talking much, much louder than we had in the sound check. So, um, I actually did have to pull the gain back a little bit on the, on the second take and forward. So, you just have to be kind of careful and, and figure out what's going to work best for the particular situation you're in. That's why you have settings. So um, that's for the microphone. Now, it's it, the interesting thing is that's how you kind of manage the noise. You kind of want to, you know, there's always this balance between getting a hot enough signal in by gaining up and um, leaving enough headroom. But then you have to back down to leave yourself enough headroom. But if you back down too far, then you're going to introduce noise. The great news on the sound device is 633 is that you don't have to worry about that very much because the sound device is 633 has extraordinary, extraordinary preamplifiers in my experience. So there's not a lot of noise. They are in a different league than most of the recorders we talk about on this channel <laughs> most of the time. Even better than the Zoom F series recorders, certainly better than the Zoom H series recorders, certainly better than any of the Tascam DR series that I've used. So it's not really a major concern. Now we're gonna talk about line inputs. That's a different story because when you're using a line input, something else is doing the amplification. So really for keeping the noise down in that case, you're going to need to look at the signal chain before the sound devices. What is it that's that's getting the, the sound from the microphones and amplifying it? If it's a, if it's a wireless system um, and you have line outputs, you know, you're just going to need to find the best settings, um, the best gain structure on that uh, wireless system to get the least amount of noise. Because really at that point, what the recorder is doing is it's bringing it in. You can you can adjust the gain some. Um, and, you know, you can use the same principles we just talked about with microphones there as well. Um, so um, that's kind of a trade-off. But, but what's going to be earlier in the signal chain is going to be important as well. So um, in that case, if you're working with something that has a very noisy preamplifier, you'll probably want to gain down on that and then use the sound device's gain um, to compensate for that a little bit to get your signal up into that zero dBU range. So that's my that's my thought and that's how I would approach it. If anyone has other input, we'd be glad, glad to hear it. So I hope that helps, Andre. Thanks for that question. Next question up from Kevin Edwards. Hi, Curtis. I wonder if you could give your thoughts surrounding sound perspective relating to recording dialogue from the point of view of camera position. And do you think that it is acceptable to underpin this type of dialogue by mixing something like a lavalier and to add a little bit more body to the sound. Kind regards, Kevin. Kevin, I think that's a fine question. I think that I, I don't like to have 
hard and fast rules um, because I think anything, you know, once you get to a certain point where you kind of have your basic chops worked out with sound, I think anything's possible. So um, I, I think it's great to experiment and to find out. I don't, I will say in the types of work that I do, which is going to be, again, a lot of corporate um, interview type stuff. I, you know, was did a job yesterday, was interview, did a job last weekend, which was also mainly interview. Um, I would typically start with just a single mic, but um, if you're doing a narrative type piece where you want to have some sort of effect that helps, that lends itself to the story, it helps tell the story better, I would be cautioning you to say, or anybody, to to not do fancy sound stuff just because you can. I would do it if it serves the story um, or if it serves the message in some way. So if you, f if you truly feel like that serves the story, then absolutely use another lavalier microphone in addition to a boom, run them together or, you know, on top of the camera, whatever you're doing, experiment and find what works and tells the story best. Um, I don't usually find that what, well, let me say this. When you're using two mics to mic an individual person for dialogue, unless they're at the exact same distance from that person, you will typically get some sort of phasing effect. And um, phasing effects are not necessarily bad. They can actually help um, create a sort of a um, three-dimensional soundscape in some ways. So because normally when we're hearing, we're experiencing phase. We're in a room and the sound that comes from some source is going to bounce off the walls and come and hit our other ear at a different time. Our ears are not right next to each other. They're a little bit apart. So, you know, there's always going to be some of that. And in fact, I think our brains use that information, that phase effect that we can detect to determine where something is, you know, spatially or near, near us in a three-dimensional space. So, um, yeah, I think it can definitely add, uh, create some sound perspective. And I think that's a fine technique to use. The only caution I would say is, um, number one, or well, two, I guess, number one, you can get phase issues and that can be destructive and distracting. And number two, if it, you know, I would only use it if it really helps to tell the story better. So those are two, some of my thoughts, but I think it's a completely valid thing. And I highly encourage everyone to experiment with those kinds of, those kinds of things. Next question is from Ignacio. Ignacio says, my question is about filmmaking with the Lumix GH4 and the Zoom F8 for audio. If I should connect the camera directly to the F8 and record embedded audio video or to sync in post with the sync audio option of Final Cut Pro 10. Which workflow is better? Uh, Ignacio, I would say the workflow that works better for you is the one that's better. Um, I don't think there's one that's, that's. Uh, I don't think it's fair to say that one is better than the other for all people, but if there's one that works better for you, that's what I would encourage you. I will tell you that for me, for most of the jobs I do, I record separately. I don't run the audio to the camera unless the production requires it. Um, when I'm doing my little just YouTube videos and things of that nature, I just record to the recorder and sync it in post. Just what I do. Um, so it it just depends. The upsides is the upside, of course, is if you do run the audio out of the F8 into the Panasonic GH4 and you get a good quality recording, you have less work to do. So that's great if that works for you. You know, if that's kind of a priority for you. Um, on the other uh, other hand, when you do run the audio into um, your camera, in this case, the Panasonic GH4, it is the camera that while the recorder is doing the preamplification, that's great. Um, the recorder still has to do the analog to digital conversion. And the Panasonic GH4 has a decent analog to, con to digital converter, but it's not the same as what you have in the Zoom F8. Um, so if you want the best in audio quality, you know, what I would typically recommend is still do the recording with your camera and then sync it in post. Also, running the audio to the camera can be a good way to get scratch audio onto the camera. And then you can still, if you're recording with a recorder, sync those in post. So you have a, a lot of different options. Obviously, there's time code as well. Um, lots of different options for how you want to do it. But I say, if you're getting the, uh, the, the quality you need by running the audio out of your Zoom recorder into your camera, and it saves you the time in post, by all means do it. Um, but if you want the highest in audio quality, that's your number one priority, then you probably want to record separately and use the audio that was recorded by the Zoom F8. So thanks for that question. And then uh, one more question here. This is from Greg Palmer. Hey, Curtis, a lot of people swear that side lobing a shotgun microphone gets you better sound quality. I'm looking at polar patterns of shotgun microphones. It just doesn't seem to make sense that off-axis recording is going to capture better, better audio. Any opinion? 
All right, let's stop there. That's the first question. Um, that's interesting, Greg. I have actually never heard that, um, but now you've got me intrigued. And if I understand correctly, what you're saying is essentially turn the microphone off, off axis to get a better sound. Um, on a shotgun microphone, that's, I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical, but I'm open to, to hearing the reasoning that people have from, if you have any resources that talk about that or give some specific examples, I'd be interested to see those. Here's why I'm skeptical. The shotgun microphone design includes the interference too, which has all the slits on the side. And by, you know, the, the, the physics principle behind that they're trying to employ here is um, to create some cancellation by taking those uh, off axis sounds and essentially subtracting them from the main sound that's being captured by the capsule. So um, talking in the side, in, se in essence, if, that's what, if I'm correct in understanding that that's what side lobing is, um, that doesn't make sense to me because that's the stuff that's supposed to be subtracted. So, <laughs> um, but if someone's got some examples and also my experience is if, if you get off axis with a shotgun mic just enough, start getting to the 45 and just a little bit beyond 45 degrees, um, my experience is that you do start to experience some odd phasing. Um, it almost sounds warbly. Um, so because I think what happens at that point is you're getting more in the side than you are on the capsule itself. And so funny stuff starts happening. And maybe it's maybe it's less than 45 degrees, but in any case, there's just kind of this one spot where things start to get kind of weird. And actually is one of the main reasons I suggest that a shotgun microphone is not the best option in a very reverberant room where you're getting the sound source into the capsule and also a reflected sound source off the walls of the same thing. So in any case, I... I, I'm interested. I'm intrigued now. Um, but my thought is, is I'm kind of skeptical. I don't know the, how that would work. All right. Second question here. What have you found is the best position for a shotgun to point at? Chest, throat, mouth. That's a really good one. And, and I, I think over time, what I've found is that it depends on the person's voice. Um, if you have someone with a very, uh, maybe a thinner voice or someone who has a particularly sibilant voice, I would probably aim a little bit more for the chest because I want to pick up a little bit more of that uh, low end. And um, for people to have uh, really, really dry or dark voices without a lot of top end, I would definitely aim for the mouth to get as much as I possibly could <laughs> because that's where you're going to get some of the higher end stuff, the, the articulation, because that's where their tongue is and, and things of that nature. So that's my main thought. I don't usually point for the throat, um, but usually more the, you know, and maybe there's a subtlety there that I just haven't learned or picked up yet, but usually I'll aim either for the chest or the mouth, and it, and it depends kind of on the... The timbre of the, the uh, timber of their voice. So, um, those are my kind of main thoughts. They're great, great questions. Thanks for those, Greg. All right, just a quick um, couple of things here today. I'm actually recording this session with my Zoom F4, and I'm using the F control here. It's kind of a fun little thing. I, for those of you that didn't see, I had a kind of an initial look at the Zoom F control over on my main channel, not not the Curtis Judd audio channel, but the Curtis Judd channel. Um, and I'm looking forward to kind of putting together a review on that. So it's been a neat little neat little device. I, I'm actually pretty happy with it. It has fairly um, limited, it's kind of a special special case device. It's not, I'm not suggesting it's for everybody, um, but I think, I for me, it's a lot of fun and it's uh, something I'm, I'm looking forward to experimenting with a lot more to create a stereo mix straight out of the recorder that could potentially be used um, for pieces that need to be turned around quickly. So. There's that, and then over on the screen here, and I'll put these links down below, a um, couple of passion projects. If you haven't seen them already, um, we finished one a couple weeks ago called Music Maker. It's about a guitar maker here in the Salt Lake City area of Utah. And uh, I did the sound on that. I'm pretty happy with that, <laughs> but would love to have your feedback on that. And then the other one that just posted last night, I believe it was, is one that uh, is called Homeless. Again, this is my friend Levi that did the directing and the DP work. I did the sound. This one was one of the hardest sound jobs I've ever done. <laughs> and I think you'll see that reflected. We we pulled as much out as we could. We pulled the stops out as best we could. Um, I was using good gear, um, but we just had some challenges. And the cut, um, there's one part in the cut where you just completely lose the dialogue from uh, one of the people we're interviewing. So um, you know, that was a decision that uh, was made in terms of where to make the cut. Um, personally, I would have liked to have cut that part out, but 
um, it did capture some emotion. So it was a, an interesting one, but you'll see, I'm, you, you may find, and I did the mix on that one as well. Um, that was really tough just because there was so much noise. We're out on the street interviewing people. And we talked about this in one of our previous sessions here and talked a little bit about the mixing of that. So I hope those are interesting to you. Love to have your feedback on those. Um, and I think that's what we have for our session for this week. Get out there and make some great recordings. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care.